Thank you very much. And I want to thank the organizers so much for inviting me to speak today. I wish I were with all of you in Paris and would look forward to going out to dinner after this talk. Um, instead, I join you from the University of British Columbia in the west coast of Canada. And I'd like to acknowledge that here I live and work on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, the tsleil and the Coast Salish peoples. Today I'm going to be speaking to you about eco-evolutionary dynamics of range expansion. I come at this from a more empirical perspective, and today I'm going to bring together both some theoretical work and some empirical work that I've been working on over the last number of years with a number of collaborators who I'll acknowledge throughout my talk. So from a biological perspective, when we think about range expansion, we're thinking about two different processes. We're thinking about the range expansion of an introduced species, so a species that was moved to a new range by people where it couldn't get to on its own. And then what happens after that? How fast does it expand across that new range? So pictured here on the left is a chestnut mining leaf insect that has moved quite quickly across France since its introduction several decades ago. And drawing back to one of the earlier talks of today, we can also think about range expansion with climate warming. So thinking about as climate warms, and here we can think on both short and long time scales, but pictured here on the right is a butterfly species that has moved north in Scandinavia across the last number of decades. So when we think about both of these processes, the range expansion of introduced species and of native species, and we want to ask some questions about how fast have they moved and how fast will they move going forward? Much of our current understanding of spread builds on theoretical models of population dynamics, mainly in continuous landscapes. And what these more classical models show is that it is the rare individuals at the invasion front that contribute the offspring that drive it forward. And the traits that determine spread are these, dispersal, the ability of offspring to move away from their parents and to establish in a new location, and the fecundity at low density. And then if we know we can estimate both of these two traits, we can estimate how fast the invasion has moved in the past and how fast it will move in the future. And even though these traits may trade off with those determining individual performance at high density, in standard models, the performance of individuals at the back, back here where it's quite crowded, contributes very little to expansion in these standard models. So the question that I want to ask today is this one. What is the role of evolution in spreading populations? And with evolution, models predict that the spread process itself can impose strong selection for greater dispersal ability. So this we call spatial sorting and for greater reproduction in the absence of neighbors. So more standard natural selection. And models predict that if one or both of these traits increases, the spread velocity itself will also increase. Okay, so here we have these continuous landscapes and we might then ask, what happens for an organism that must move through a habitat that's not continuous? So in general, we expect that the rate of spread, how fast that range expands through a continuous landscape should be much faster than say for an organism that depends on forest habitat moving through a place like this where it must cross gaps of habitat that are unfavorable. So the question that I want to ask today then is do the same rules for how populations move through continuous landscapes apply to those that are in landscapes that have patches, say gaps between suitable habitat? And we know from some recent models that the expectation is that no, that there are different processes operating here. So that when the probability of one individual producing enough offspring to colonize the next patch is very low, instead of a range expansion jumping from patch to patch, the most likely outcome in the next generation is the increase in density in the current patch, such that it is these dense patches that are producing the offspring that drive the invasion forward. This result presumes that individuals are discrete. We know that if we assume some kind of continuous density, that some tiny fraction of offspring will disperse everywhere. So if then, um, 
if selection, if sorry, selection, if the um, range expansion moves differently in a continuous compared to in Apache landscape, what then, how might that then change the role for evolution? So that's the first question I'm going to ask today. How does landscape patchiness change selection pressures in advancing populations? And I'm going to use some mainly simulation work to talk about this. And then I'm going to move on to some empirical work where we evaluate does evolution on ecological timescales in expanding populations increase the spread velocity? Can it do so predictably? And then ask about what is this role of landscape fragmentation to influence the potential role of evolution? And then building on the empirical results from work that I've done as well as others, I'm going to finish the talk thinking about this question, how can evolution modify predictability in range expansion? So first then, do we expect selection for the same traits when the habitat is fragmented into patches? So to answer this question, we used a series of simulation models as well as an analytical solution that's based on this integral difference model for spread. So this very simple model that has just three parameters. So we're predicting the number of individuals at time step next year, t plus one at location x, is a function of dispersal. So we use this dispersal kernel here, we're using a simple negative exponential kernel. So it's a function of how many offspring move from y to x, but also a function then of how many individuals there are produced in each location y. And this growth function here is a function of two demographic traits, the population growth rate when rare and the sensitivity to competition. So that as the number of individuals in a patch size increases, the population growth rate of any one individual is reduced as it gets more crowded. So here in this work, what we've done is we're going to assume that dispersal cannot evolve. The flip side is if dispersal can evolve, we expect that it should evolve to go faster for offspring to be able to move further and further and further. So I'm going to focus on these two demographic traits. And I'm going to assume a trade-off between the two, such that more competitively sensitive individuals have higher fecundity. So here, the sensitivity to competition is moving up as you go to the right. And the population growth rate run where run rare lambda is moving up as you go up. So individuals over here on the left are very insensitive to competition. You can think of these as competitive individuals, but they don't, their lambda is quite low. As we move to the right, the sensitivity to competition increases and we get diminishing returns in lambda with increasing alpha. So the prediction is that in patchy landscapes, it's these strategies from the left side of this trade-off curve that should be favored. That's because we, with discrete individuals, we are assuming that the population is going to build up in density and it's these dense patches pushing it forward and the ability to survive in a dense patch should be selected for. In contrast, in continuous landscapes, we expect to see higher lambda even with a higher cost of sensitivity. And that's because when the landscape is continuous, these rare individuals at the front are not paying a cost for having low competitive ability. So we went up calculating the evolutionarily stable strategy in two ways. We developed an analytical solution to calculate what is the optimal evolutionary stable lambda at each for each D. So D governs how steep this trade-off is. And then we also use simulations to explore the role more in more detail of discrete individuals and at intermediate gap sizes. So I'm gonna show you some of these simulation results. First, we grabbed a uniform distribution of 10 strategies. We ran them through landscapes with different gap sizes and recorded which is the strategy at the leading edge after 40 years. And we repeated this hundreds of times. Um, Leia is asking in the chat, how is the sensitivity to competition put into the competition in the population equation? And it comes in into this growth function here. So we're using a standard Beaverton Holt model for population growth. And so lambda is not lambda, sorry, alpha is down here, the sensitivity to competition.
So we find that the results support the prediction that the optimal strategy depends on the degree of landscape patchiness. So here on the horizontal axis is gap size. These are continuous landscapes here on the left, very patchy landscapes on the right. So these landscapes have gaps that are five times the mean dispersal distance. And then the vertical axis is the median, you can think of it as sensitivity to competition. So as you go up, these are strategies that have higher sensitivity to competition and also increased lambda. So for this particular trade-off curve that has very steeply diminishing returns in fecundity as the sensitivity to competition increases, we found that it's these very low sensitivity to competition strategies that effectively win in the patchy landscapes. There's not much variation in this result and it aligns very nicely with the analytical solution for the ESS. In continuous landscapes, we find a higher population growth rate when rare, so higher lambda. These are, remember, again, are the invasions where the leading edge should be experiencing very little competition. One of the other things that I want you to notice is that these, each panel shows the distribution of strategies. And I want you to notice that there is substantial variation among which strategy wins. We did some further simulation results to show that in this particular framework with discrete individuals, there's a very strong dependence of the eventual winner on the early time steps. I'm gonna come back to this idea of variability a little bit later on. So to summarize then, simulation results show that at the leading edge of the invasion, the most successful strategy differs. So that in continuous landscapes, we get this high fecundity strategy despite high sensitivity to competition. And in the patchy landscapes, it's the strategy with the lowest sensitivity to competition that is the winner. And again, these results are supported by the analytical solution. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to build on these results and ask empirically, do we see this when we actually, when we evaluate this theory with real organisms? Before I get there, I just wanna give a little plug for some work being done that, in fact, that's been finished by a student, Carla Urquhart, who's now a PhD student in my group. What Carla wanted to know is in the work that I just talked about, we assume that dispersal cannot evolve. And Carla asked, well, what if dispersal can trade off with reproduction? We know that in lots of organisms, individuals cannot both be really good dispersers and produce lots of offspring. What if there is a trade-off? And so Carla built these trade-off curves like this. So we have increasing lambda going up, increasing dispersal ability here to the left. And you can see that organisms that are really Great dispersers have low lambda and the converse is true. And what Carla really wanted to know is how does this interact with landscape patchiness? If dispersal trades off with reproduction, what, how does that change the role of evolution in, in spreading populations? So I'm gonna show you just a piece of her results here. She ran simulations through both continuous as well as many different types of fragmented landscapes. In the left column here, I'm showing the continuous ones. In the right column, I'm showing the very highly fragmented ones. The top row shows this strong trade-off and the bottom row, the weak trade-off. And then these are showing the distribution of which strategies won in each replicate of the simulations with the very dispersive ones on the left side of each panel and the fecund ones or the high lambda ones on the right. So you can see that in the continuous landscapes, we get a lot of spatial sorting. That is that the most dispersive landscapes no, the most dispersive individuals are dominating at the front of these range expansions. That's true for both strong and weak trade-offs. In contrast, spatial sorting is not dominant, dominant in these highly fragmented landscapes, particularly where the trade-off is quite strong. And instead it is these um, fecund strategies that are most common. And importantly, without spatial sorting in these highly fragmented landscapes, the expansions actually get stuck. So all of these pale colored bars are expansions where this, um, these weak dispersers with high fecundity are dominating and they also don't go anywhere. So the expansion doesn't move at all. So this brings up some interesting questions about what do we know about the trade-off between dispersal and fecundity in real organisms? And also thinking about the role of spatial sorting versus natural selection is likely to change quite a lot depending on the landscape structure. 
you can see her paper just came out last year in theoretical ecology. So you can see more of her results there. I'm going to move to this second part of my talk, thinking about empirical results to, to evaluate these two questions. Does evolution on ecological timescales in expanding populations increase the spread velocity? And can it do so predictably? And then what is the role of landscape fragmentations in influencing the potential role of evolution? So empirical progress to answer these questions has been somewhat limited because this is a really hard question to ask. We need to ask questions that are now going across really big geographic spatial scales as well as long time scales. And what we have are some retrospective case studies, the very best data of which come from cane toads in Australia. And so what you can see from this graph, these are toads that were all put together in the same place and asked how fast can they go? And toads that come from populations that have been established for a very long time don't move as far as those that come from more recently established populations. And that that result in combination with some other results looking at both the biology and using modeling, we can relate that it is evolution in these cane toads that most likely is contributing or contributing, you know, at least some and maybe entirely to the fact that the range is getting faster and faster through time, this range expansion. But we also know that stochastic processes can play a big role. So this is one range expansion, but what would have happened if the cane toads had been introduced again? Would we see the same thing? And so what this leads to is a role for replicated and controlled studies. So I'm gonna talk now about some results from work that I started a number of years ago, working with this model plant system, Arabidopsis thaliana. So this is this little fail crest plant that lots of evolutionary biologists use as well as plant geneticists. And what we did is we created a series of replicate range expansions that move through linear arrays of pots. We started the range expansions in these leftmost pots using 14 genotypes. These are what are known as recombinant inbred lines. And what that means for the Arabidopsis is that they are almost entirely selfing. And so the offspring of say this red dot look are identical to its parent. Okay, so we started with these 14 genotypes. Individuals grew up, they created, they flowered, they set seed, and then they dispersed. We are only capturing in one direction throughout these landscapes, which we call these little runways. And so in the evolving treatment, we would expect to see some kind of sorting such that individuals at the front may be either more dispersive or more fecund. Individuals at the back growing in these crowded patches, we might expect to be more competitive. So we can look at how the distribution of genotypes changes through time. But the other thing we wanted to know is how much does evolution make a difference for these range, expand, these range expansions? So we created a non-evolving treatment where we allowed the individuals to grow up and disperse. And then once they dispersed, we replaced those individuals. And I think it's a little probably a bit hard to see on your screen with individuals at the same location, but with different, with the equal frequencies of the starting genotype. And we can ask then how much faster does the, do these range expansions move with evolution compared to when we are effectively stopping in particular spatial sorting. So in fact, these landscapes do move. Here are six generations moving through a continuous landscape. The horizontal axis is distance and the vertical axis is density. So what you can see is that through time, each generation advances a little bit further than the previous. And you can also see that there's a fair amount of variation. So we can ask then, do the evolving populations, do they move further through these landscapes? So we ran these experiments for six generations and you can see that on average, the evolving population spread, this is on the vertical axis is the furthest dispersed seed over time, over the six generations spread 11% further. This is the result for continuous landscapes. So here, each replicate is a thin line, and the thick lines represent the means. So you can see that the evolving populations spread further. So in this case, with evolution, the invasions move further, and they do so predictably. On average, they are all moving a little bit further. But what about what happens in these heterogeneous landscapes? How does landscape structure influence the potential for evolution to increase invasion velocity? In this system, we created patchy landscapes simply by removing pots. We have pots with soil separated by pots that are empty. 
And what we found is that as gap size increased, so did the effect of evolution and was significant. So here I'm only showing the very patchiest landscapes. And what you can see is that on average, the evolving population spread three times as far as the non-evolving populations. Patchiness and evolution also influence the amount of variability. So we see more variability in the patchy landscapes compared to in the continuous landscapes. This makes sense. It's difficult to colonize those, to cross those gaps between suitable habitat. And the evolving populations were also more predictable. That is the amount of variability among these green lines, among the evolving populations is less than the amount of variability among the no evolution, popu non-evolving populations. So hang on to this idea because I'm gonna come back to this in the last part of my talk. But first I wanna ask this big question. Why was the effect of evolution most pronounced in the patchy landscapes compared to in the continuous landscapes? Here we evaluated two hypotheses. Was there simply more rapid evolution in the patchy landscapes? Did they evolve in this case faster to make the range expansion move faster? And the second hypothesis we evaluated is, were there different trajectories of evolutionary change? We explored evolutionary change in two ways. We looked at changes in the relative frequency of genotypes. So at the end of the experiment, we genotyped individuals at the leading edge, and we could ask, what is the composition of genotypes compared to the starting populations? And we also looked at three traits that were relevant to spread, height, competitive ability, and dispersal. So here in 3D space are these three spread relevant traits, competitive ability, moving up in this direction, dispersal and plant height. The star in the middle shows the mean trait rank. So we looked at, we ranked the genotypes from one to 14. So 14 is the most, most competitive, for example. If there were no evolution, we would expect that the replicates would end up very close to the center here. And instead, what you can see is that there's quite a bit of spread. So most replicates were a bit more competitive with quite a bit of spread in the other traits. And we could measure how much evolution in traits was there. What is the distance from the mean to what we actually found? And we find no evidence for faster evolution in these in the patchiest landscapes compared to in the continuous landscapes. But the amount of evolution in these traits is similar. But what our results do support are the predictions that different traits are favored depending on the landscape types. So you can see that in the patchy landscapes on average, most replicates were taller, they were better dispersers, they moved this direction and they were all more competitive. And what we found in simulation results is that being more competitive makes a much, much bigger difference in the spread velocity in the patchier landscapes can compared to in the continuous landscapes. What you can also see is that in the continuous landscapes, there, are, there were lots of ways to effectively be a winner, that there's much more variation in the spread across this trait space. If we look at the genotypic data, again, we see no evidence for faster evolution with changes in the genotype data. You can see that most replicates were dominated by one or maybe two genotypes compared to the equal frequencies we started with. And again, instead, the changes were associated with these different traits and genotypes favored in the different landscapes. And mainly in the patchiest landscapes, it's these few genotypes, in particular, this light blue one that dominated. So what our results suggest is that with evolution, a species has the potential to move faster and faster because the traits that make them better at moving, at expanding the range are becoming more common at the edge. So this result nicely supports earlier theory. Um, in the case here of these traits, the individuals at the front were able to disperse their seeds a bit further. So in this last part of my talk, what I want to build on is some of the results that I showed you a bit earlier, asking this question about how can evolution modify the predictability in range expansion? So at the same time that I was working with Arabidopsis, other groups were working in other systems doing very similar experiments to ask the same question. To ask this question number two, does evolution in expanding populations increase spread velocity? And does it do so the same? So we got together a working group at UBC a few years ago 
And we looked at, so at the time there were these four different groups working in different systems. So we have two species of beetle. These are bean beetles at the top and these are flower beetles, one species of spider mite, and then here's the plant, Arabidopsis. And in all of these systems, evolution was manipulated experimentally. So spatial sorting was turned on or off. In some cases, the role of natural selection was reduced. And if there were no effective evolution, all of the experiments should be right here at zero. But instead, what we see is a positive effect everywhere, such that across all these systems, rapid evolution accelerates the speed of range expansion in these replicated experiments. But somewhat surprisingly, we also see an effective evolution on variability. And such that in each study, different, there were different effects of evolution on the amount of variability among replicates. So in these beetle populations, both bean beetles and the flower beetles, the evolving populations had much more variability compared to the non-evolving populations. The spider mites have similar, very, what we call expansion variability or similar predictability. And then in, op, in contrast to the Arabidopsis in which the evolving populations are much more similar. So in evolution, one of the things it does is to increase the amount of variability among replicates. That makes our ability to predict the speed of any one replicate more difficult. So if one of our goals is to be able to under, is to be able to make a prediction about how far a future range expansion will go, we need to know something about will evolution make the range expansion more or less predictable and how and what are the systems that we might expect to fall out on this case on the right compared to this case on the left? So here you can see more clearly with data that evolution is increasing variability in some systems and decreasing variability in others and to varying degrees. So with Ruth Hoffbauer and Tom Miller, we wanted to ask, can we develop a new framework to understand why we see these differences across systems? And then to be able to make predictions for what we might see in new systems. So we developed this framework where we argue that expansion variability, so we define expansion variability as how much variation there is across replicates, is driven by a balance between variance, what we call variance reducing and what we call variance generating forces. So these are evolutionary processes that many of you know quite a lot about. So we can think about then the balance between these deterministic processes. So here in the case of range expansion, we're thinking about selective processes, either spatial sorting for increased dispersal at the leading edge or natural selection, increasing um, life history traits such as fecundity when rare. So that's on one side of this, imagine this teeter-totter. And on the other side, we have stochastic processes. So in the, and again, in the case of range expansion, we may have genetic drift, some genotypes becoming more common due to chance. We also see often a role of gene surfing such that one genotype reaches the leading edge due to chance, then it basically surfs along the edge, even though it might have lower fitness than other genotypes. Okay, so what then might be the process, the traits or the characteristics of species that might lead deterministic processes to becoming more common so that we would expect evolution would reduce expansion variability or drift factors becoming more common? So we had two hypotheses. The first is this, that the population size at the leading edge influences the effect of evolution on expansion variability. So imagine the contrast between a shallow expansion front, such that here we have space on the horizontal axis and population size on the vertical axis. And that here at the leading edge, when the front is shallow we, and the population size is small then, we would expect that drift, these stochastic processes would be more common, that, that evolution would increase expansion variability. And in contrast, when the expansion front is steep, so here we're thinking about where Ali effects are common, where there's positive density dependent dispersal, where the dispersal kernel is such that offspring don't move very far from their parents. So here where the population size is quite large at the leading edge, we might expect selective processes to dominate and that evolution will decrease expansion variability. So in some new work in my lab with Arabidopsis right now, one of my graduate students, Carla Urquhart, who I mentioned earlier, is starting to evaluate this. Can we actually look at this 
with data as well as with simulations. And then our second hypothesis focuses on the idea of the mating system. So does, and we can think about mating systems either as thinking about organisms moving from being very asexual and clonal to being very sexual. And we can also think about what is the role of recombination? Is there lots of recombination such that offspring are very different from their parents or is there very little so they're similar? So in the case where offspring highly resemble their parents, we would expect that evolution would decrease the expansion variability, that these, the individuals at the leading edge are going to become more and more similar and that all replicates should do kind of the same thing. In contrast, where there's very low parent offspring resemblance, where offspring may be quite different from their parents, either due to high levels of outcrossing or to high levels of recombination, that if we look across replicate range expansions, we might expect that evolution would increase expansion variability. So I've talked about just two things, the population size at the leading edge and mating system. There are other things that might influence these differences. So for example, genetic architecture or interactions among these drivers. And I would argue that one of the things that comes out of this is that we can move from theory to experiments. And we, now we can come back in the other direction and say, okay, given this variation in these experimental results, most of which I don't think we would have predicted, how can we then use theory in different ways through both simulations and, and analytical solutions to understand these differences in expansion variability? To summarize then what I've talked about today, I've shown you with empirical results using the Arabidopsis that evolution on ecological timescales and spreading populations can increase the velocity of spread. And that the outcomes of replicated range expansions are variable. Evolution can increase or decrease that variation, reflecting a balance of variance generating and variance reducing evolutionary processes. And the other thing I want you to take away from this is that landscape features can modify not only expansion speed, but also the evolutionary processes and traits that are favored at the leading edge. So where do we go from here with new mathematical theory? So I think that this is a place where we can move from individual based models to analytical solutions, for sure, for thinking about what are the effects of evolutionary processes on variability in speed, and for understanding why dispersal is sometimes the main driver of evolutionary acceleration and sometimes fecundity is. We saw that different traits were favored across these experiments. So if this, these are the kinds of topics that you're interested in, I wanted to give a little plug for Chef Lucher, Christina Cobald, and Tom Miller and I are hosting a workshop at the Fields Institute in Toronto at the end of June. There is the option to participate remotely, and there's also the option for some people to join us in person. So feel free to email for Chef or I, and also we now have a website from Fields that talks a little bit more about this workshop. Okay, and with that, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Any question for our speaker? Jeff, uh, I saw you raise your hand. Did you want to ask a question or maybe someone? In yes, the there, there's, there's a question. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, but, uh, thank you for the nice talk. This is Leonard uh, Decaens talking. Um, um, so in the Cainted's example, I think there's a recent paper showing that uh, there's um, before high dispersers were uh, sampled uh, in the front, but now they actually sample more like uh, um, s s slower dispersers, but uh, better, uh, better uh, made uh, because I think there's a trade-off between um, the, the, the long legs that can improve the dispersion and the uh, fecundity because it impairs with sexual prediction. And, and so I was, uh, I, I didn't get really, when you talk about the trade-off uh, in patchy landscape versus continuous landscapes, if you had uh, kind of this effect of uh, history, like first you have strong dispersers, but then 
uh, later on on the expansion you might have better uh, mates or uh, fecundity yeah thank you that's a really interesting question so in the theoretical work that i talked about that uh, was led by carla urquhart we didn't we there isn't i mean we're not following history in that way that i think you talk about such that there isn't this effect that maybe one thing is favored first and then the next thing that's favored later. But I think that's a really interesting question and an interesting way to be keeping track. I think a lot of our simulations don't go for thousands of years and maybe we would see it if they did. I think we know from metapopulation literature that there's definitely cases where we might expect to see different traits favored through time. And that in some cases is actually better to stay put depending on the landscape structure, that if the probability of reaching the next patch is really, really low, that at some point we see no more selection for dispersal because your fitness is basically zero if you leave the patch and then you die before you get to the next patch. But thank you for that question. And I mean, I guess what I'll say is no, we didn't look at that. And yes, it seems like a really interesting and exciting way going forward. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any questions? So uh, Jennifer, I have a question. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very nice point that you make about how the uh, uh, environment, uh, is it reducing variability or increasing variability? So in, in one of your um, results, uh, when you add patchiness, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're less diverse uh, genotype. They, they're all selected for higher and more uh, dispersal plants. So uh, what do you observe about the spreading speed? So how does the loss of uh, diversity affect the, 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 um, the, invasion, the invasion speed in terms of the, the entire population? Well, that's a good question. So I think I didn't point this out. Overall, they, I mean, the invasions move much more slowly in the patchy landscapes compared to in the continuous landscapes. Um, they it takes a long time to build up in density and then to colonize the next patch. But I think your question is maybe more like what, what is the, like if you lose all diversity and you just have this one genotype left, like what does that mean? I mean, I, we did, um, PhD student Nikki Lustenhauer, who's now a postdoc in Scotland, did another experiment where she asked what happens if you end up with say one genotype at the leading edge, and then you run into a habitat that is has a less favorable environment. And what she showed is that um, what we saw, like the selection in, our, in the environments that we worked in that shows that we get more competitive individuals and also better dispersers, but those, the, those particular genotypes, some of them happen to be really, really poor at living in say where it got where there was a drought or where it was really, really hot. So I think if in our landscapes, if we kept them going, we would assume that they would stop going faster and faster and they would just move at the speed of, speed of the genotype at the leading edge. But that if they were to reach some new environment, that they might now not be the best genotype for that environment. And then, then the range expansion both could stop and potentially move back, right? To go a little bit extinct. So that's an interesting question. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, one question by Fitch of uh, online. Yeah, hi Jennifer. Um, thanks for, for the great talk. I find it really fascinating that people can do experiments on that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that's great. I was wondering about a small detail of your numerical simulations slash experiments. When you write down an integral difference equation um, and you say you you ran many simulations. Did you have a continuous density or were you still looking at, indi at, at individual units, at individuals that disperse? Ah, oh, good question. No, I didn't make that point very clearly. We, we were looking at discrete individuals. So we used a Poisson distribution for reproduction such that we could only produce discrete numbers of individuals. That was important for the questions that we were trying to ask, particularly with this idea that in Apache landscape, if you have a continuous distribution that some the individuals get everywhere quite quickly. And, and similarly, each individual would disperse according to, to something drawn from a random number, but from your kernel, but they would have a finite dispersal distance for each yes. individual. 
Okay. Yes, also that of finite dispersive distance. Yeah, good question. Um, my, my guess is that some of the results that you get would be different if you looked at theoretical models with a continuous density. Like in particular, yes. the I, I think the effect of the density dependence wouldn't be there. Yes, I, th I agree with you. Yes, I think that, okay. that is the case. It's like the, the neat, this discrete nature is one of the things that makes the result that we have for sure. Good, thank you. Hi, sorry. Thank you very much. This was really uh, an amazing talk. Uh, but uh, I did not really catch all the details of the experiments. Like, uh, how is uh, the, the dispersion occurring? It is, uh, is it like a really like the natural process of the seeds moving from one patch to the other? And how do you measure the evolution of uh, dispersion? I, sorry, I did not catch that. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So it's... I will say that it's tricky to get individuals to disperse in the lab. In the case of the beetles, most of them are like they're crawling through little tubes between petri dishes and they get, say, two hours to move or 10 hours to move and that's it. And the doors get closed. In the case of the plant, so in the case of the Arabidopsis, um, they have no adaptation to, say, like fling their seeds really, really far. And instead, their dispersal is mostly passive in the sense that um, they have these little seed pods and they open up and then the seeds fall down. In the it, Outside, so not in the greenhouse, it would rain and there would be wind and that would kind of knock the seeds off and move them along. So we use what we call like a simulated rainstorm. We basically sprayed the siliques with a squirt bottle. So not really high water velocity, but enough to get them wet. And that was enough for the seeds to move. So we, and because, so what that answers the question of, did they disperse? So more or less naturally, although not identical to what they would do outside. Your question about dispersal evolution. Um, I, are you asking a question about whether they could evolve to be better dispersers than what they started with? Yeah, I think, yeah typically this kind of yeah. question. Okay. So that's a great question. So in the case of the Arabidopsis, the answer is no, we have these 14 genotypes and the offspring of each genotype are identical to their parent. Um, in these recombinant inbred lines, each individual is homozygous at every allele or at every, at every gene. And so imagine across these 14, some of them are better dispersers and some of them are weaker dispersers. And so what we're getting is this sorting of genotypes. In the case of those other species that I talked about, um, the beetles and the spider mites, they do have recombination and they do have sex. And so they can then, they could evolve to be better dispersers than the starting genotype. What we're seeing is um, a change in the relative frequency of the genotypes we started with. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer. It's uh, Vincent Calvez uh, speaking. I have w one question about your, your perspective uh, regarding the mating uh, uh, process, uh, <laughs> because it, it might be expected that if you change, you also change the shape of the front. If you have a descendants which, which are close or, or, or which do not resemble their parent, it may affect also the, the shallowness of the front. So it may affect the first uh, component of your, of your hypothesis. And mm -hmm. I, I was uh, asking myself how, how you, 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 you uh, how, how can you distinguish then which, uh, which uh, cause of variability is uh, right. behind this, uh, these two, uh, two aspects? Uh, okay, so that's an interesting question, right? Okay, so what if the amount of recombination influences the population size of the leading edge and now these processes are interacting? Yes. That's a great question. Um, that paper was really fun to write because we're just throwing out ideas and hypotheses and we didn't get to the point of the next step of actually evaluating them. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question, but I do think it raises a good point that in the results that in the work that follows, it will be quite important to be thinking about what are the effects of making these decisions on, um, like how does that interact? So Carla Urquhart in my group is working on some individual based models where she can adjust the amount of recombination and the amount of outcrossing, but this just started. So I don't know what the answer is, um, but that's a good point. And it's something that we should be thinking about for sure going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.